right. Hey, good morning, Calvary. How are we doing today? Well, hey, before we get uh, too into it today, I just want to take a moment. I want to ask if there are any uh, veterans here in the room today, would you please stand so that we can honor you this weekend? Thank you. Um, I speak, I hopefully on behalf of everyone here, just thank you so much for your willingness to serve um, and to make this country safer and give us the opportunity, the freedom to do what we do here on Sunday morning. So to all of our veterans who are here in the room and who are watching online, thank you so much. Um, and we honor you today. Um, also, I have some exciting news. You know, over the last, um, it feels like over the last six months, Every month, we're adding a new staff member here at our church. Um, we got another one coming. I mean, is that anybody cool with that? All right, so um, next week, um, Joey Rowland and his wife, Jen, and their family will be here in, uh, at Calvary, um, where we, in both of our services, we will be having a chance to meet Joey, um, and we will have an opportunity. We'll have a special call business meeting in both of our services to hopefully affirm Joey Rowland as the next kids pastor here at Calvary. There will be a meet and greet um, after each service. And so um, I would encourage you guys to come meet Joey and his family. I would encourage you this week to be praying for him and for his family as they're kind of thinking about um, what it would look like to transition here. And I do certainly want to ask you to be here next week as we make another important decision to invite um, someone onto our staff team. And so I look forward to seeing you guys uh, next week. Uh, if you guys will, uh, open in the copy of the scriptures to Exodus 16 um, is where we're at today as we continue through our uh, study of the book of Exodus. And we pick up today in 16, uh, in verse 2, and it says this, it says, um, The whole congregation of the people of Israel, they grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we have died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Well, then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. And on the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, at evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling that you grumble against him. What are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Well, then Moses said to Aaron, say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. This is God's word. Um, I don't know if you've ever said this or if you've ever thought this, but maybe spiritually speaking or in your life, you've said something along these lines. I feel dry right now. Or man, I feel like I'm in a desert. Or I feel like I'm in a spiritual wilderness right now. Now, you don't have to show your hands. I'm going to put him on the spot. But I imagine that many of us have said, man, I just feel like I'm in a dry season or a wilderness season right now. Well, we've been studying the book of Exodus for several weeks now. And this is where the Israelites are at. They're in the wilderness. They've been freed from oppression and slavery in Egypt. Remember the 400 years of slavery in Egypt. And now with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, God has uh, delivered them. He's saved them from their oppressors. And they're journeying now. They're, they're no longer in Egypt, but now they're journeying toward the promised land. But yet, they're not in the promised land yet. They're in this weird in-between from slavery. They're rescued from slavery. They're journeying toward the promised land. But in the meantime, they're in what we call the wilderness. And think of how an Israelite would describe the wilderness. I'm starving out here. 
This is what we might say when we're in a difficult season. I'm just weary. I feel like I'm wandering around. And I'm not really sure what God is doing or what my purpose is. I'm grateful that God rescued me. I'm grateful that God delivered me and he was faithful in the past. But I'm not sure where he's leading me today. I, yes, I've seen God's faithfulness in saving me, but he also made these promises. That we, he would take me to a land flowing with milk and honey. But I don't, feel, I don't see these promises coming true today. When will these promises uh, come true? I'm out here in the wilderness. I've got all these expectations that are unfulfilled and these desires that are unmet. You see, for the Israelites, the wilderness was an in-between place. They're no longer in slavery, but they're not in the promised land yet either. And how many of you feel that way? You're like, I'm no longer in bondage to the way things used to be, but yet I'm not feeling, I don't feel the fullness of all that God has promised. And it's in the wilderness that the faith of the Israelites is tested. And it's in the wilderness where they ask this question, can I trust God? Can God be trusted when I'm in the wilderness? And the Exodus story, I know for many of us, we all have said the same things. I feel like I'm wandering right now. And the Exodus story teaches us what God is doing in the wilderness. You see, to get from Egypt to the promised land to get from bondage to flourishing, to go from immaturity to maturity, to go from anxiety and fear to shalom and peace, the Israelites, they had to go through the wilderness. You know, we often go like, why didn't God just zap them right out of Egypt and stick them in the promised land? God used the wilderness. God conspired with the wilderness to teach his people how to live. And likewise, for you and for me, it is in the wilderness seasons of our lives. We hate them. We don't like them. We kick and scream and fight against them. But it is in the wilderness seasons where God shapes us, forms us, tests us, and conforms us into his image. And in our text today, we're going to see that God is gracious in the wilderness. The wilderness is not a place of death. God's intention is never to draw us into the desert to kill us or dry us out, but rather his intention is to draw us out so he can draw us near and so that he can heal us and save us. And so if you're here today and you've ever wondered and you've ever asked, what is God doing? What is God doing in this season of my life? Where is God and why do things feel so difficult and dry and weary right now? What is God doing in my life? This text is for you. And so the first thing I want, there's three things I want us to see today about the wilderness. And the first is this. In the wilderness, God feeds us. You know, it's been one month since the exodus from Egypt. So this is the Israelites. They've got 40 more years of this, all right? They're one month in and they're already grumbling and complaining. But it's been one month since they were rescued from Egypt where God miraculously rescues them, delivers them from their enemies. But then God immediately leads them into the wilderness. And life in the wilderness is difficult in its own right. It's not slavery, but it's hard. I mean, and, and the thing that was bothering them is they were looking for something to eat. Now, we know that they had food, so they weren't left completely to starve. I mean, they had livestock with them. So that means that they had the means to make cheese and milk. And if they really wanted it, and they they, they could have meat. But they grew tired of whatever it was they were eating, and they started grumbling. One counselor says that grumbling is a low-grade murmur of negativity. Grumble, 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 right? Anybody know somebody who likes to grumble? Low-grade, constant murmur of negativity. Grumbling also is a form of cynicism. And cynicism is a sign of hopelessness. And this is true for us. When we're grumbling and griping and complaining about something, it's probably because we've lost hope and we've grown cynical. And the question is, is where, where, where are the Israelites losing hope and where have you started to lose hope in your life? You want to know where you, you want to um, do some diagnostics in your soul and figure out where you've lost hope. Where do you grumble most often? To whom, toward uh, what, and toward whom are you most cynical? Well, a funny thing happens when we start grumbling. 
And that is that when we start complaining, it's like a snowball effect, and our complaining usually gets exaggerated over time. You know what I'm talking about? This is what happens with the Israelites. Look at what it says. They get a little dramatic, okay? Verse 3, the people of Israel said to them, Oh, would that we have died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt. Oh, in Egypt, when we sat by those meat pots, and we ate our bread to the full, but you've brought us out into the wilderness to kill us all with hunger. You notice what they're doing here? They start grumbling and griping and complaining, and then they start exaggerating. And they start remembering Egypt, the place where there were slaves, with fond memories. (laughs) They're sitting around like they were slaves a month ago. Now they're sitting in the wilderness going, man, you remember Egypt? You remember those meat pots? You remember the, the, the bread? You remember the buffet line there? Oh, Egypt, the good old days, baby. And you're like, is this true? Not at all. Like there were slaves. They were given probably not pots of meat like they're remembering. They were probably given small rations of food, just enough for them to keep their strength so that they could build more storehouses for their oppressors. But in the wilderness, our minds play tricks on us when we're in the wilderness, don't they? And we start remembering the past more fondly than it was. And that's exactly what happens with the Israelites. They're going, oh man, those days in Egypt. A couple weeks ago, I went back to my hometown for my 20 year high school reunion. I was hanging out with my high school buddies and they're talking about their high school football glory days. And uh, man, you know where I'm going with this, right? I mean, those guys, to hear them talk, about 2003, you know, you would have thought these were all four and five stars, okay? That's not how I remembered it, okay? It was more like one and nine, okay, is, was the, the record that year. And I mean, the, but if coach would have put me in, you know, we would have, you know, I'm, I'm just laughing, shaking my head, but we tend to distort the past, don't we? Um, it's funny when we do it with high school sports. It's just kind of funny. Everybody rolls their eyes when somebody's talking about their high school glory days. Man, my head, the man, Uncle Rico, you know. But, you know, for the Israelites, it's problematic because they allowed their present displeasure and discomfort to distort their memory of the recent past. They looked back and they romanticized Egypt. And let me ask, have you ever looked back and romanticized a difficult season? Have you ever looked back and romanticized a former destructive relationship? Or have you looked back and romanticized a season of your life or a behavior in your life that was in the past? Or maybe some of us, I I do this all the time, in the pain of your current season, in the challenge of whatever you're facing today, you look back and you minimize the difficulty of previous seasons. So some of you are here, maybe your marriage is a little challenging and you're looking back to when you were single and you're like, man, those were the days. I had all my time to myself. You know, I had this freedom. But then if you, but the truth is, if you remember when you you were single, that season had its own troubles and you had your own disappointments and discouragements in that season. Or maybe you're here and you're raising children and you got small children and they are just wearing you out. And you turn to your spouse and you're like, man, you remember when life was so easy when we didn't have these children? But you're forgetting that the difficulty of that season. You know, I'm sitting here, I got a new puppy. I've never been a dog person. And I'm like, this is the worst thing ever. He's chewing up everything in our house. He's always licking my face and I don't like it. He's biting my clothes. And I'm like, man, like, remember the days we didn't have a dog? Those were awesome. But what I'm forgetting is that my kids complained every day that they didn't have a dog. And so I got them the dog to end the complaining. Now I'm the one that's complaining, right? Maybe you're here. Maybe you're like, you know, you're, you've climbed the ladder in your career and You're just drowning under pressure and responsibility at work. And you're looking back, you're going, man, you remember those days when I was a junior associate? Man, I didn't have any, I clocked out at five o'clock and went home and man, those were the days. But you remember how you actually felt in those days? 
You felt overlooked, you felt disrespected. You're like, I just wish somebody would put some pressure on me. I wish somebody would give me responsibility. I wish somebody would trust me enough. You see, we, we have a tendency, we, we take whatever we're do, uncomfortable with in our current season, and we look back on other seasons with much more fond memories than there really were. And when we're in wilderness and difficult seasons, it's easy to look back on the previous times and tell ourselves how great everything used to be, and then we start grumbling in the present. And the Israelites did this, but they were looking back on their slavery, and all they can remember were pots of meat. And I'm willing to bet that those weren't even real. They're probably just imagining how good the meat was. And how much do you think this broke God's heart? Because he's going, I delivered you from your oppressors. I delivered you from slavery. You were there for 400 years. You cried and begged and pleaded and prayed for centuries for me to rescue you. And then I rescue you with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And in one month, you're turning around and you're looking back to Egypt with fond memories. But yet, even though God's heart is probably broken in this moment, he's gracious. In verse four, says, the Lord said to Moses, behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. So God, in his grace, even though they're grumbling and griping, he feeds them. But he doesn't just feed them in any normal way. He feeds them with a test. And the test is this. I'm going to send bread from heaven every single day. And all you have to do is receive it. There's only two rules. One, gather only what you need every day. And two, don't take leftovers. You know, we have a tendency when we're uncertain about the future to want to hoard everything we can. And God says, don't do that. I'm asking you to trust me every day. I'm asking you, will you trust me? You know, my wife and I, um, when we adopted our oldest son, we had to take several adoption classes. And my wife is an adoption consultant now, and so she teaches a lot of these classes now. And one of the things they prepared us for was that children who have a history of poverty typically have food issues. They hoard. One of the challenges of bringing a child into your home who has a traumatic past is you have to convince them that you will provide for them and that their needs will be met. And yet these kids with a history of poverty and a history of trauma, they will sit at the dinner table, they will eat their meal, and then they will take the leftovers and they will stuff their pockets with them because they have trouble trusting that the next meal will be provided for them. And it's, it's, it's tragic because you're going, you've got a new life, you've got a new home, you have loving parents, but you're still living as if provision is scarce. And one of the markers that you know that a child has begun to trust a new family is when they come to their parent for food rather than striving for it for themselves. And the thing is, is we're not so different, are we? God gave the Israelites a test, and the test is, do you trust me? Can you receive my blessings on my terms? Remember, all throughout the Exodus story, the people of Israel, they're asking, can we trust you, God? God, can we trust you? Are you? Can we trust you? And now God says to them, well, can you? Can you trust me? Are you ready to receive my bread as my people? And that requires trust. The, and what God is saying to them is he's saying, look, guys, the old ways of hoarding and keeping bread don't apply here. You're not in slavery anymore. You're free. And the old ways don't, don't work here. And he's testing them to see if they trust him yet because the way they got bread in Egypt was by hoarding and by anxiety. And they had a scarcity mindset where they felt like they had to get theirs and they had to get what they needed. And the question now for them in freedom is can they learn a new way of getting bread? And in our wilderness seasons, God will test us in similar ways because all of us, we have all kinds of ways that we receive acceptance and approval and security and pleasure. We do it through pride. We do it through accomplishment. We do it through secrecy. We do it through manipulation. We do it through dishonesty. We do it through selfishness. We do it through harshness. But that is not how you receive life in the family of God. And so God will test us to see if we trust him. And God says, the way that you receive life in my family is not to hoard 
and connive and manipulate, but simply to receive. To receive what I give you day by day. And will you receive this? Yet we all have a tendency to hoard, don't we? We want to gather as much approval as we can from others. We, we want to gather as much pleasure as we can. We want to gather as much security as we can. We want to, uh, and when we do this, we show that we haven't learned to fully trust God yet. You see, most of us live with a scarcity mindset. We think that pleasure and acceptance and security is a limited, finite resource. And if somebody else has it, that means we're missing out. And so we try to hoard as much as we can. But we must learn to trust God for our daily bread. God is, has unlimited resources. He can provide for you. Betsy Childs Howard wrote, um, she's a friend of Rebecca's, but um, she wrote an incredible book titled Seasons of Waiting. I recommend it to anyone and everyone. Well, Betsy's story was um, she got married later in life than she had hoped. And uh, she talks about in this book how her season of singleness, her time of singleness was a struggle for her. Um, And she says it felt like a wilderness, And she said, you know, in that wilderness, I wanted to be married, yet I wasn't. And she said, the thing I had the most trouble with was waiting on God and trusting in God during that time. And she says, during that time, there were all kinds of temptations. There's temptations to lower her standards for men. There were temptations to pursue intimacy and companionship on her terms rather than on God's. But one of the most profound things that she says in her book is she says, you know, one of the hardest things parts when you're in a season of waiting is that you don't know how long it'll last. Isn't that the most difficult thing about a waiting season? Because you start thinking about the future and you're going, how long am I, can I endure this? And you get anxious and you get afraid. And Betsy said that one of the turning points for her was when she learned the principle of daily bread. And she learned to trust God for daily bread. And she said, this would be my prayer every day. She would say, God, I don't know if I can stay in this season forever. I don't know if I can handle that, but I do trust you, God, that you can help me make it through the next 24 hours, that you can get me through the day. I mean, even Jesus said, each day has enough trouble of its own. Don't worry about tomorrow. And she's learned the principle of the daily bread. And she said, if I think about 20 years down the road, I will become overwhelmed with panic. But if I take it day by day and trust that God will give me daily bread today, she said, I can make it. And you can too. Because whatever season you're in today, you might be in a really hard season. You might be in a really um, tough time right now where you don't know how long it's going to last. You don't know how difficult it's going to get. And the more you think about the future, the more anxiety you get. But let me ask you this. Do you believe that God is strong enough to help you get through today? to the moment where you put your pillow, your head on the pillow at night. I would hope that most of you, you're like, I have the smallest, tiniest little mustard seed faith, but hopefully we can muster enough faith to go, God, you're gonna help me make it through today. And then you wake up tomorrow and you ask him the same question and you take it day by day. This is the daily bread. You see, in the wilderness, God feeds us. Not always the menu we want, not always the portions we want, not always the timing we want, but do you trust that God will provide for you your daily bread today and then again tomorrow? The second thing I want you to see, and that first one was the longest one, so relax. (laughs) You're gonna get out of here. Second thing is this, in the wilderness, God prepares us. You know, one of the things that I find fascinating about this narrative is Moses is so chill the whole time. Like, you notice this? The people are mumbling or grumbling against Moses. Moses, you brought us out here in the wilderness. Why'd you do this to us? Moses, man, we knew you couldn't be trusted. And yet, Moses stays calm. He mediates between the people and God. He doesn't get angry with the people. He doesn't accuse God. I mean, Moses stays calm, leads with confidence and trust that God will provide. I mean, Moses in this section of scripture is the perfect picture of non-anxious leadership. And you go, how did Moses do this? I mean, because I don't know about you, but if I delivered an entire uh, nation of people from slavery, and then a month later they're griping at me about the food, I'm probably gonna lose it. You know what I mean? Like, what are you guys doing? You were in slavery. 
But Moses, he stays calm. How did Moses do this? Remember, Moses had already spent 40 years in the wilderness himself as a shepherd. He had already endured the harsh heat of the desert. He had already learned to trust God for water and food. He had already learned that God provides. And he could look back on the 40 years he spent in the wilderness in Midian and go, God was faithful then, he'll be faithful today. And his previous wilderness season prepared him to lead God's people in the wilderness because he knew that God would provide. Listen, I knew when I was younger, like when I was, um, you know, like, I mean, I, I just used to hate spiritual cliches. Like they used to madden me so much. You know, somebody from church would come up to you and they'd say, hey buddy, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. Or, oh, you don't know that God is all you need until God is all you, uh, uh, until God is all you got. Or all things work together for good, buddy, for those who fear the Lord. And I used to hear older Christians say these sort of things. And as a young Christian in my zeal, I was like, man, take me deeper. Don't give me these platitudes, these surface level promises. Get, get to, I want the meat of theology. Give me something. And then I went through a few wilderness seasons of my own. Painful, dark, lonely, uncertain, scary wilderness seasons. When I wasn't sure where life and joy was gonna come from each day. And in those seasons, to my chagrin, I learned that the cliches are often true. And only those who have traveled through the wilderness know them to be true. God is faithful to provide. And he will make a way where there seems to be no way. And you won't know that God is all you need until he is all you've got. But here's the thing, you can't really know these things unless you've been through the wilderness. You can't really, you can believe it, you can sing it, you can assent like knowledge to it, but you can't know it until you've seen God's faithfulness in the wilderness. And I've learned, and I'm constantly learning many of these things the hard way, just like Moses. But as I look back on my life, it's clear to me that God has used my wilderness seasons the most painful stretches of time in my life. He's used those seasons to shape me into the person that he's calling me to become. And it's not just me. You read through the Bible and you see this theme all over and over and over again. God uses the wilderness to prepare his people for the life he's called them to. Noah, David, Leah, Ruth, Naomi, Paul, even Jesus, and many people in this room, I suspect, could stand up and say, it was in the wilderness seasons where God taught me his faithfulness. Listen, wilderness is not wasted time in God's economy. And some of you college students, you haven't faced it yet, but it's coming. And when it does, I want you to remember that wilderness time is not wasted time in God's economy. God will use that stretch of time to cultivate in you the character that he's called you to be. In the wilderness, God prepares us. The final thing is this. In the wilderness, God is with us. I don't know if you notice this, but in verse nine, it says, Moses said to Aaron, say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness. Remember, they had been looking backwards to Egypt. They were too afraid to look forward to what was ahead because it was uncertain and it was unpredictable. But Aaron spoke to them and he said, look toward the wilderness. And when they took their eyes off of Egypt and looked toward what was ahead, you know what they saw? The glory of the Lord who appeared in a cloud. See, during their entire time in the wilderness, the glory of God was in their midst. God dwelled in a pillar of cloud and fire which led the way that they would follow through the wilderness. But they, in that first month, they were way too busy looking back on Egypt to notice that God's glory was in their midst. But when Moses and Aaron called them to worship, they turned their eyes away from Egypt and they turned it toward the life that was ahead. As scary and unpredictable as the life ahead was, they looked ahead and what they saw was not the scariness and the, the, the uncertainty of it all, but rather they saw the glory of the Lord going before them. God did not leave his people alone in the wilderness. He went ahead of them and he paved the way. And likewise, for you and I, when we're in wilderness seasons, we're so tempted to look back 
and remember the good old days and remember how it didn't used to be this, this hard. And we start grumbling and murmuring and we grow cynical and hopeless, but we must look up. Aaron and Moses, they said, everybody, we're gonna have a worship service and you're gonna look up and you're gonna look toward the wilderness. And that's what we do. That's why we gather every week is so that we can all remind one another to look up. Life is so hard. Most of us are looking down at our feet, just trying not to trip all week. And we come here together each week to say, take your eyes off the path in front of you and look up. And what you see is that the glory of God is with you. He's going before you and he's clearing the way for you to step into the future with confidence and with faith. And when we look up, we see that we have a God who joins us in the wilderness and leads us to the land that is ahead. And if you're ever here and you're like, or if you're here and you're like, okay, Israelites, wilderness, that was so long ago. How do I know that God is for me? Where where is God in my wilderness? How can I know that God is there? You look to the cross. You look to Jesus because it's on the cross where you see a God who knows your pain because he's been there and he knows it doesn't last forever. You see, Jesus passed through the wilderness of death only to rise three days later. And what this means for us is that wilderness, the wilderness will not have the final word over your life because Jesus conquered it. For 40 more years, for 39 years and 11 more months, the Israelites will be in the wilderness. They'll wander in the desert, they'll eat the same meal over and over again, and there will be days where they are tempted to believe that God has abandoned them. And on those days, all they have to do is look up, and there they see the presence of God among them. And they see that they're not alone. And they see that God did not bring them into the wilderness to die, but rather he took them to the wilderness to teach them how to truly live. And for you and me, we all go through wilderness seasons, but we must continually look up to the cross of Christ and see that God has not left us alone. He has come for us. He has suffered with us. And our suffering will not last forever because Jesus went through the wilderness and conquered it three days later. And he has invited us, follow me, and I will lead you into eternal, abundant life. That is the good news of the gospel. The good news of the gospel is that no matter, not only did God save you from your sin, But God is with you in the wilderness and he will lead you to the promised land because he has promised. That's the good news of the gospel. Let me pray for you, Calvary. God, we thank you for this book of Exodus. God, I confess sometimes the Old Testament can just seem so confusing to me. But God, when we really take a look at it, we see that the story was being written all along that you are showing us that Jesus is faithful. You're showing us that we no longer have to be slaves to fear and sin and shame and guilt. But God, in the wilderness, you also teach us that we don't have to grumble and complain when life is difficult. Your word teaches us that you are with us, that you are guiding us, and that you make good on your promises. And your promise is that you will lead us to a place where our tears will be no more and death will be no more and sorrow will be no more because you are leading us to the place you have prepared. And so God, I pray that you would give us faith to trust you in the wilderness today. I got to pray specifically for anybody in this room um, who's struggling right now. Uh, I I pray for anyone in this room who is in a desert season. For anyone who might be tempted to give up on their faith. God, even I, I pray for anyone in this room who might be tempted to even give up life. God, I pray that you would remind us that you're with us and that you're preparing us for the life you've called us to live. God, I pray that we wouldn't give up. I pray that we wouldn't look backwards I pray that we wouldn't romanticize Egypt, but rather we would look ahead to what is to come, to the new heavens and the new earth, where every tribe, tongue, nation, and language will be gathered around your throne, singing, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The earth is full of your glory. And every tear will be wiped away from our eyes, for you yourself will wipe them from our faces. God, give us a vision for what is ahead, not what is behind. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Church, I'm gonna invite you to stand. We're gonna sing one more song. I don't know, I just, I, I, maybe God is speaking to you right now. God is saying to you that uh, maybe you're here and you're just in a tough spot and you don't know how much longer you can take it and you just need to trust 
that God's going to help get you through it. But as we sing, I just want to invite you. We've got an altar up here. You're welcome to come and just lay. That's what this is for. It's for you to come and just open your hands and say, God, I've been trying to hold on. I've been hoarding. But God, I just need to trust that you're going to get me through this. Maybe you're here and you just, your eyes have been down on the ground just trying not to trip over the sticks and the potholes and you need to lift them up and see the glory of Jesus. And so as we sing, you've got an opportunity to just come and whatever, whatever moment you need to have with God, here's the time to do it. And so I want to invite you to come. If you're here and you just need somebody to pray with you, I'm here, Dan's here, Chris is here. We would love to pray with you, pray for you, pray over you. So as the Holy Spirit leads, I invite you to respond as we sing. So you guys come.